Okay, thanks, Lawrence. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, Lawrence just said we're moving on to sediment pollution now and trying to understand its, its key sources within the tall catchment. Um, I stress this work is very much work in progress, so this is quite a short presentation. We're wading our way through a lot of laboratory analyses at present. Um, and as you can see from the slide, it's a collaborative effort between uh, ADAS, I depart ADAS in two weeks and take up a post here, um, Northwick here and also the University of Southampton where my visiting chair is. Okay, well I guess the, the River Tor is symptomatic of many other rivers across England and Wales and that if you drive through it there's very clear evidence that um, it does have a sediment problem. I think as you drive through the catchment then visually you can see evidence of what might be potentially contributing sources. So we can see things like heavily poached pasture topsoils, we can see runoff from cultivated land, fodder crop fields, we can see delivery of sediment through agricultural field drains. An important delivery route for fine sediment in our catchments. Field drains serve about 40% of agricultural land across England and Wales and a very efficient delivery route they are. And I guess those sorts of on-site issues are manifested in the river channel in terms of off-site issues, so those might be the siltation of the riverbed or the so-called muddy flood syndrome. Now because we're interested in targeting measures to help control these sorts of sediment problems, then obviously we need some decent information on the key sources of this particular problem. Now, the important thing about TRIP, I think, is that it's really trying to help address WFD compliance failures. And that means, actually, that we need to think carefully about the process linkages between the sediment pollution and the impacts on the aquatic ecology. Because those process linkages help us to structure and inform the tracing work that we're actually undertaking. So if we consider the riverbed, then we have our framework gravels, the coarse material. Sand-sized material tends to infiltrate the pore spaces and that in its own right can cause concretion and block emergence of fish. But I think the key thing, actually, is that the infiltration of the sands has two very much more important impacts. By clogging the, spore, uh, by, by clogging the pores, the seepage velocities in the gravels are reduced. That means we get more fine mineralogenic clays trapped. And it also means we get more sediment-associated organic matter trapped. So for the tracing work, we need to source the fine mineralogenic sediment because those clays tend to coat the fish eggs and block metabolic exchanges. But critically, we also need to source the sediment-associated organic matter because that competes with the incubating fish for the supply of dissolved oxygen. So in terms of the source fingerprinting work that we're undertaking, in terms of sourcing those mineralogenic fine clays, we're considering a number of catchment sources, so we've got the grassland topsoils, cultivated topsoils for damaged or cut up road verges. We've also got channel banks and subsurface sources, so incised tracks, ditches, those sorts of features in the landscape. And for this we're using fallout radionuclides and that laboratory programme is, is uh, still running. The count times for the individual samples are typically two days each. So. Those samples are still passing through the laboratory, and so I'm not talking about this element of uh, the work during this particular presentation. In terms of the sediment-associated organic matter, we're considering some additional sources. So we've got farm manures and slurries. Again, the road verges, because they have a high leaf litter content. In-stream decaying vegetation, things like macrophytes. And we've also got the human septic waste, um, small sewage treatment works, and the domestic septic <coughs> tanks. So the work that we're doing is covering five uh, target subcatchments in, in the River Tor. And this map just shows the outlet sampling points for each of those target subcatchments. So we've got the Tor at Tor Bridge, we've got the Yo at Stopgate Cross, Nathan Brook downstream of Pepper Lake, 
Uh, we've got the Dark Chip Carves Bridge and we've got the Little Dart at Stone Hill Bridge. And the work to date really is just sampled sediment at those outlet sampling points. Uh, but during the forthcoming season, we will expand the sampling programme, sample along the channel reaches within each of those target subcatchments so that we can generate some more representative data that's less scale dependent really. <coughs> So the source tracing work, well this is founded on the link between the, the properties or the fingerprints of the potential catchment sources, so that could be the eroding channel banks, the agricultural topsoils, the farm manures and slurries, or the uh, human septic waste, and the corresponding properties of the particulate material delivered to the river channel. So to use these sorts of procedures, you sample your potential sources, analyze for a number of properties and their fingerprints if they're able to discriminate between those sources. You sample the sediment in the channel, analyze for the same properties and then you use some statistics and numerical modeling, compare those fingerprints and apportion the sediment stress back to the key sources within the catchment. For the sediment associated organic matter, we are using a number of fingerprint properties we're using molecular structures analysed using near infrared reflectance spectroscopy. We're using bulk stable isotopes for carbon and nitrogen. We're also taking humic extracts from the particulate material and, and using some fluorescence analysis ourselves. So we're combining all of this into a composite fingerprinting procedure. Different properties reflect differing environmental controls and that tends to make the uh, fingerprints more robust. Now, in order to link the source data to the impacts on aquatic ecology, including fish, one of the things we've done in terms of collecting samples of the damaging clays and organic matter infiltrating the riverbed is use retrievable basket traps. So, these are simple mesh traps. You fill them with local clean framework gravel, and then you insert them in an artificial red or nest, which is dug into... Uh, the riverbed. They have a, an outer sleeve which started off being air conditioning ducting but it tends now to be a supermarket green bag and that's collapsed down around the base of the basket during its emplacement so that means that the interstitial water and sediment can pass naturally uh, through the basket whilst it's deployed. And then when you come to extract them, you just pull the bag up around the basket and that means when you pull it up through the water column, you don't lose the fine clays and organic material that's infiltrated the sampler uh, during its period of uh, deployment. And as you can see in the top left, we do actually still put these in if the conditions are uh, pretty tough. So, um, in terms of the work that's occurred to date, we installed baskets at those outlet sampling sites in December 12, and then we're linking the extractions to critical periods in embryonic fish development. So we take the baskets out in February to try and have a link with the uh, eyeing stage, in March to have a link with the hatching stage, in April for the emergent stage, and then in late uh, May to try and capture the late spawners. So um, we're trying all the time to try and link our source apportionment data as closely as we can to that one particular biotic endpoint, the fish, which is responsible for some of the failures uh, across this catchment. But I must say that we're also doing some sampling using a different technique uh, throughout the calendar year to provide some further background information and those data sets are yet to come online. So, just by way of some preliminary results for the sediment associated organic matter, so here's River Tor at Tor Bridge for the eyeing stage. So, this is for the period December 12 to February 13. And just some preliminary source apportionment estimates. So, we see the manures and slurries about 18%, the road verge is 21% decaying in-stream vegetation 42 and septic waste definitely contributing about 19 percent. If we move to the hatching stage at Tor Bridge, so these baskets were deployed between December 12 and March 13, 
And we see millions <coughs> and salaries going up about 38%, road verges 18, in stream decaying vegetation about 34, the septic waste still there uh, about 10%. We move to another site, the River Dolch. Again, for the eyeing stage, so the baskets deployed December 12 to February 13, inclusive. The manures <coughs> and slurries 21%, road verges low at 8%, in stream decaying vegetation 57 human septic waste again definitely contributing uh, about 14%. And the corresponding data for the hatching stage. Manures and slurries 38%, the road verge is 7, decaying macrophytes 47, <coughs> and human septic waste down there at 8. So, what are the key messages thus far? Well, the manures and slurries are an important source of that damaging sediment associated organic matter. But I think critically that is very significant because the BOD of those materials will be high, typically in excess of 20,000 milligrams per litre. So we've got quite a significant contribution and they're very oxygen hungry. We could see from the result slides the decaying vegetation is typically the dominant source. There's lots of experimental evidence from across the UK of decaying vegetation being blasted into framework gravels during high flows and some of that evidence comes uh, from long-term salmonid monitoring sites in Scotland that Chris Solsby and other people have worked on. But I think the key point there is that the BOD of those materials will be very much lower. So whilst they're dominating the source apportionment in terms of percentage, the linkage with the oxygen consumption will be less important. And we could see that there is a definite uh, line of evidence that human septic waste is definitely contributing. It's a reasonably significant percentage in terms of the apportionment, but the BOD will be very much lower, typically just two to 500 milligrams per litre. So I think the key thing is that source apportionment in its own right is never quite enough, particularly in terms of understanding the linkages of the ecology it's the oxygen consumption demand of, of these materials that needs to be taken uh, into account. And as we move forward, we will wait for source apportionment results on the basis of the BOD and probably generate a link with the sediment oxygen demand and consumption within the river channel. We're undertaking some measurements uh, to gain that data now. So, just to conclude, these sorts of procedures provide some cross-sector data. They place the agricultural losses in the context of additional sources, such as the domestic septic tanks. The framework that we're using covers both mineralogenic and organic components of sediment stress. That's important because if you check the WFD definition of sediment stress, it defines both mineralogenic and organic. These sorts of data sets, once we finalise them, do provide a line of evidence for assisting the, the targeting of the measures. These sorts of procedures provide a decent link to the point of biological impact. And they're not fail-safe. Even the tracing procedure for some associated organic matter is not guaranteed to work at all sites. It is sensitive to environmental conditions. And I'm just publishing a paper now which shows that it, it's not fail-safe but it certainly appears to be working well um, at these particular study sites. And moving forward, we're going to link these sorts of data to a cost-effectiveness tool for on-farm mitigation measures and try and demonstrate what the potential impact of targeted on-farm interventions might look like. Okay, thanks.